to welcome you here today, or if you are joining us Facebook Live or YouTube, we're just so glad that you have chose to be a part of um, our worship today. We don't have many announcements today, but one, we would like to remind you that we will still be having our family fellowship uh, tonight at the YMCA pool. That is from 5 to 7. We ask that if you come out to join us for that, that you bring your own basket. So fill it with whatever your family wants to eat. We're not going to have a covered dish table or anything. So pack the, your basket for what your family wants to enjoy. And that will start at 5 o'clock tonight. Is our deacons still doing ice cream? And our deacons will have homemade ice cream. So if you forgot deacons, you still have time this afternoon to go get your supplies for that. Um, also, if your child signed up to do the Ridge Kids Day Camp, that starts this Thursday, this Wednesday, for our K through fifth graders, you will come to the foyer of the Family Life Building, and that is where we will do the check-in of the temperatures and take your lunches. So that is important that you don't forget to bring your lunch um, with you each Wednesday. But for, that is all that we have today. We're looking forward to that, and we are so glad that you are with us today. So at this time, if you would just join us in a moment of prayer. Thank you to Heavenly Father for this day. We just thank you for the opportunity to come together to worship, Lord. Um, we just ask that as we go through worship, if it's through the song, if it's through the message that Eric leads us in, that you will just open our hearts and minds Put away what we're going to decide that's going to go in our basket today, what we're going to do for lunch today, and let us just soak in everything that is given to us today. We thank you for this day. We ask that you be with those that are unable to attend with us as they may be healing from a surgery or a sickness. We just ask that you covet them and be with them throughout the day. And we just thank you for the wonderful school year that these teachers and students have been able to go through, and we just ask that you continue to be with them in the days to come. And in Christ's name I pray, amen. that we, the children of God, can gather together and worship Him. So this morning, I hope that you've come ready to receive a blessing, but also to be a blessing. Today, as we begin our time of worship, I want to just have you note the, uh, the beautiful prayer shawls that are right up here uh, behind our praise team or right at our praise team. These, hand, these shawls have been put together by some very loving folks, and occasionally we take time to be able to just offer a blessing upon those shawls. It doesn't give them any magical power or anything like that, but what we do is we pray over these because we know these shawls will be going to people who are in need, people who are hurting, people who are dealing with illnesses, people who are suffering losses. And so these are a blessing that are going out into our community. And so this morning, I'm going to ask you if you would join me in a time of prayer as we seek God's blessing upon those shawls and upon those people who will be receiving them. Let's pray together, okay? God, we thank You that You gather us here together, Your children, to remind us of our connectedness not only with You, but with each other 
Lord, we thank You for the opportunity that You give us to grow together and to make a difference in our community as we exalt You, as we offer our love to You. Lord, as we are a reflection of You in all that we do and say. Today, Lord, we're thankful for the hands that have put together these beautiful prayer shawls. We're thankful, Lord, for the hard work, for the prayer, for the time that have gone into assembling each one. But Lord, now we pray for those who will be receiving those prayer shawls. We know that there are many in our community who are hurting, many who are dealing with losses in their lives, some who are just struggling with spiritual warfare. And Lord, as they receive these prayer shawls, we pray that they might be reminded of the blessing You offer us, the blessing of Your presence, the blessing of You wrapping Your arms around us each day. God, we pray that today as we worship You, whether we're right here sitting in the presence of friends, Lord, or whether we have joined You uh, by video, we pray that we might be willing and ready to receive the blessing You have in store for us. And God, we pray that in the same way You would allow us to bless others. Thank You, Lord, for Your great love. We do pray for those that are hurting and for those that are in need right now. God, we pray that You might let us be Your hands and Your feet. Thank You again for allowing us to be a lighthouse in this community. And now, God, we pray that You would bless the service so that You might be glorified in our hearts, our minds, and our lives. We love You, Lord, and we thank You for that great love that You've shown us through Your Son, Jesus Christ, and for the presence of the Holy Spirit that fills our hearts. We lift this prayer in Jesus' holy and wonderful name. Amen. Well, you know, we do things a little bit different now because of our safe distancing. So I'm going to ask you just to stand where you're at and wave at the folks around you. If you're at home, we welcome you. We're glad you're with us. But let's welcome one another during Koinonia.
Psalm chapter 94 verses 18 through 23. If I say my foot slips, your mercy, O Lord, will hold me up. In the multitude of my anxieties within me, your comforts delight my soul. Shall the throne of iniquity which devises evil by law have fellowship with you? They gather together against the life of the righteous and condemn innocent blood. But the Lord has been my defense and my God the rock of my refuge. He has brought on them their own iniquity and shall cut them off in their own wickedness. The Lord our God shall cut them off. Let's pray. Father God, we are so grateful that you love us. Even when we fail, you love us. This song was absolutely perfect for today, Lord, and I thank you for that. I thank you for those who sing, who praise your name. And Father, we thank you that you're allowing us to work and to give back to you and to help others. Father, it's such a blessing. Thank you for our pastor. Bless him as he preaches. May the power of God just fall upon this church today in Jesus' name. Amen.
many people today are walking around in a wilderness. Some are dealing with an emotional wilderness or maybe they feel as though they have been separated from friends and they're experiencing a physical, relation, relational kind of wilderness. Some of us are dealing with spiritual wildernesses. God has been faithful to us throughout the ages. And as He was bringing His people out of Egypt, He wanted to remind them that He was blessing them. And so He instructed Moses to tell Aaron to bless the people with a very special blessing. And today, as we enter into this time of worship, we hear the words of that blessing as we hear the song, The Blessing.
Well, if you live in Boiling Springs, or right near there, you've seen all kinds of construction along Main Street. All kinds of new things are being built, but in order for something new to be built, other things had to come down. Other things had to be destroyed so that new things could move in. And the same is true for us spiritually. If we expect for God to do a great work in our lives, if we expect to receive the blessing of God, we must be willing for Him to come in and destroy the old, to get rid of the carnal, the selfish, the self-centered us, and allow Him to dwell in our hearts, in our minds, in our lives, in our souls. He must take over every aspect of our lives. No stone can be left unturned, and that's the way that we so often want it. We want God to come in and clean up what we want Him to clean up. We want Him to clean up our messes, but there are certain sacred places that we hold so dearly that we don't want to hand them over to God. But in order for God to do His greatest work, He must first do His greatest destruction. He's got to get rid of the old in order for the new to be built. Now look, that's, that's something that we need to realize as believers is that God wants all of us. He doesn't want part-time Christians. He doesn't want people who say one thing and live another way. He wants people who have a talk that matches up with their walk. He wants people who are into His Word. He wants people who welcome the Holy Spirit. He wants people who accept His Son, Jesus Christ, as Lord and Savior. Over these past weeks, we've talked about who Jesus Christ is and the many beautiful aspects that He brings into our lives. And whenever we talk about Jesus Christ being the destroyer, it sounds like a negative thing. But the truth is, when you look at how He destroys and what He destroys, and when He destroys, it's a very beautiful picture of His love. Because Jesus, God, will never take away the things that will glorify Him. And that's really what our lives are all about. If you call yourself a child of God, then you are going to be a reflection of God. And if there are things in your life that hold you back from being that reflection of God, then those things need to be taken out of your life. I don't know whether you're dealing with an addiction or whether you're dealing with some kind of, a, uh, 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 some kind of an issue in your life where you just can't let go. But that's what we have to do. We have to be able to let go of ourselves. We have to be able to let go of those things that we think are important and allow God's importance to dwell in our lives. Today, we talk about Jesus being the destroyer. I love to watch war movies. I, I sort of grew up doing that. Uh, never been involved in a war, except for a, my own spiritual war. But I love to watch the war movies because typically at the end of a war movie, you're going to see someone, some side, some philosophy is going to have to completely surrender to the side that has won the war. Now, I just want to let you know this, that there's been a war going on in your life since the day you were born. You may have not realized it, but there's been a war, and sometimes that war has been played so subtly that you don't realize that the battle is even taking place. But there's been a battle for your soul from the day that you were born. You were born into a sinful war world, and we are all prone to sin. Your sin might be different from mine, but we're all battling the same opponent, and that is Satan. Here's the deal. 
We can't do that on our own. No matter how, how spiritual we think we are, no matter how strong we are in our faith, we cannot win that battle on our own. It takes the great hero, the great destroyer, to come into our lives, and the one who destroys is the one who will build us back the way that He wants us to be built back. But we've got to completely surrender to that good force. I'm going to tell you, Satan's after your heart right now. He's after your soul. I don't know what battle you are facing this week, but I'm going to guarantee you that every person who's sitting in this congregation and those who are viewing today, you've had some kind of battle in your life. You know what that battle is. I can tell you that the battle stems from the fact that Satan wants to have hold of your life. And if there's something inside of you that you are fighting off, the opponent is not God. The opponent is Satan. He's the one who wants to ruin your life. He's the one who wants to steal and kill and destroy you. But God comes through the form of Jesus Christ to destroy the one who wants to destroy you. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that encouraging? You go back earlier, I told you that in the book of Numbers, God reminded His people, the Israelites, as they were coming out of their captivity, out of their bondage in Egypt, God wanted to remind His people that they weren't walking through that desert alone. He wanted to bless them and He wanted to remind them that the blessing went beyond just that generation. It went to their children and their children and their children on to this generation. God has blessed us throughout our existence. And He wants us to remember the blessing. He wants us to remember that He has given our lives purpose and that He created each one. I love to think about this. That in all of creation, in all of the beauty, all of the splendor that God has created, He made you to be part of that creation. How wonderful is that? That God made you to be part of His creation. The other day I was talking with a, one of the discipleship groups and we were talking about how God so beautifully decorated the world. And the thought that came out of that was, you are part of the decoration. How wonderful that you are part of the decoration that God has created you in a beautiful, wonderful way unique and special way to decorate His creation. He doesn't need us, but He wants us because He loves us. And He was willing to hold on to us by dying for us. What a beautiful gift we have. We will never understand how beautifully God has created us until we surrender who we are. There is this beautiful cathedral that stands in a Swiss village. And in fact, the name of the cathedral is the Mountain Valley Cathedral. Uh, beautiful stained glasses. I mean, it's, it's a very ornate cathedral. Beautiful woodwork. And inside of that cathedral is this magnificent pipe organ. Years ago, that pipe organ developed some issues and it was out of tune. And no matter how beautifully the organist would try and play that beautiful instrument, the notes that were coming out of it were very sour. And so experts were called in to try and repair this beautiful, grand pipe organ. And for over two years, people tried to work on that and correct the problems, but all attempts failed. Nobody could correct the problem. And then one day, an elderly gentleman came to the cathedral and spoke with the sexton and said, could I try my hand at repairing the organ? And the sexton said, well, we really don't have anything to lose. We, we can't even play it now because it's so terribly out of tune. And this elderly gentleman began to work on the pipe organ 
And for two days straight, he worked diligently. After those two days of work, he began to play the pipe organ, and it was magnificent. Every note was perfectly pitched And this gentleman began to play and that pipe organ had such great volume that throughout the village people could hear this beautiful song being played. People were amazed. For two years they couldn't even listen to the pipe organ and now it was being played and it was so beautifully done. Everyone wanted to know who this man was. And so they asked him and he said, well... To be honest with you, about 50 years ago, I was the one who installed this pipe organ. I knew how every note should sound, and I knew how to make those notes sound perfect. And he said, and today I wanted to come back and reconstruct what I knew was so beautiful. It's a great image of how God is in our lives because as we go through life, we lose our focus and we become out of tune with what God really wants for us. But the Master is always ready to step in and reconstruct our lives. He's always ready to get us back in tune with the beautiful harmony He's developed for our lives. The problem in the world today is so many people have walked out of step and out of tune with God that they've just gotten used to it. The notes that are being played are so sour and so bitter and we've become so accustomed to that that we don't even recognize that there once was a beautiful song. Folks, if we could just turn our hearts toward God, if we could just turn our hearts toward home, if we could just lean on our Creator, if we could just depend upon the One who created us. Oh, how much more beautiful this world could be. In the Scripture today, we discover that as our lives have been broken over time and as we have become, as we have become out of tune with, with God's desire in our lives, there is this way There is this way where we can overcome our selfishness, our disobedience. We can overcome our missteps. We can overcome singing our songs out of tune. I'm not just talking about literally. I'm talking figuratively here. The songs that we hear coming from so many people today are not songs of love and rejoicing. They're songs of hate and bitterness. God says, I love you. I love you enough that I'm willing to come in and to destroy what has been destroying you. I'm willing to come in and take away the pain and the sorrow and the anxiety and the fear and the hurt that you've been experiencing. In 1 John, we hear these words. 1 John 3, beginning in verse 7, we hear these beautiful words. Dear children... Do not let anyone lead you astray. He who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. He who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. No one who has been born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in him. He cannot go on sinning because he has been born of God. This is how, <clears throat> this is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not a child of God, nor is anyone who does not love his brother. In the book of Hebrews, we hear a little more about this. In Hebrews 2, beginning in verse 14, Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death. That is the devil. And free those 
who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. There's so much to this. First of all, we want to acknowledge this. Jesus Christ comes into our lives to destroy Satan's plans for you. God comes in through the form of Jesus Christ to destroy the plans that Satan has for you. Satan has the plan to destroy your life. That's what he wants you to do. He wants you to live in fear. He wants you to worry about every aspect of your lives. He wants you to live life on your terms rather than on the terms that God has established for you. In other words, He wants you to live a self-centered life. And boy, does that not sound like our world today. (laughs) If it's not about me, it doesn't matter. If it's not about the things that I like, it doesn't matter. If it's not about my family, it doesn't matter. If it doesn't, if it's not about my this or my that, it doesn't matter. But the truth is we all belong to one God. We are all His children and what matters to Him ought to matter to us. That ought to be our priority. You might have heard about, I told you I love to watch these old war films, but, but I, I have watched films before and watched documentaries too about Japanese soldiers following World War II who were posted on isolated islands. They were there to defend those islands and following the war, they never got the word. They never heard about the end of the war. And so for years, these Japanese soldiers were standing on these islands defending them against an opponent that had already won the war. I want you to think about that for just a second. How many of us are trying to battle against Satan? How many of us are trying to win a war against the one who's already been defeated. When Jesus Christ came into our lives, Satan's plans were gone. Now, the problem is, not all of us believe that yet. Not all of us have bought into that. Because if we were really listening and really reading and really understanding God's will for our lives, we'd know the battle's already won. We don't have to worry about Satan, but Satan does still hold on to the fact that many of us are just ignorant. And when I say that, I don't mean that in a bad way. Ignorance means not being aware of the complete truth. And the complete truth, the whole truth, the big T truth is that God loves you so much that He sent His Son Jesus to die in your place. And if you believe in Him, He will give you eternal life. Now, Satan loves to deceive you and make you think that there's no way that that could be done. That one person couldn't die for your sins. That just by believing, we would have eternal life. Satan loves to fool us because he wants us to fear death. And when I talk about death, I'm not just talking about physical death. He wants us to experience physical death because He is the conveyor of death. But He also wants us to experience spiritual death. I used to, when I was growing up, think that spiritual death would occur when you physically died. But I'm telling you, there are a lot of people walking around in this world right now who need some spiritual CPR. They're spiritually dead right now. They don't have anything or anybody to believe in. What we do as Christians, we're supposed to bring the truth, the hope, the faith in God to these people who are hurting so desperately. Satan does hold on to the power of death. It is because of sin we will die. Romans 3.23 tells us that all have sinned and will fall short of the glory of God. And whenever we fall short of the glory of God, whenever we have sin in our lives, we will die. That's the punishment. But here's what Satan doesn't want you to know. Although you will experience a physical death in your life, you will not 
have to experience spiritual death. God has created you with a soul, with a spirit that goes on for eternity. Now, it's your choice. This is your choice. Do you want to spend your eternal life in heaven with God, with Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, with other saints? Or do you want to spend your life eternally separated from the love of God? That's your choice. God gives you the freedom to make that decision. Everyone in this room has that opportunity to choose God or Satan. The problem in the world is there's too many people right now who are choosing Satan. They love evil. They love being corrupt. They love the corruptness, the brokenness of this world. And that's the area they thrive in. But I'm telling you, things are going to come to a screeching halt one day. And we have to know where we're going to go. Satan knows that death is required for our sin. Satan's been sinning from the beginning. John said, from the very beginning. Now, when we talk about that, we're talking about Satan's demise. When he, when he actually rebelled against God. Remember, in, as we read through Scripture, we know that Satan was identified as Lucifer. Which is really another way of saying the bright shining star. Lucifer at one time was a good and powerful angel of God. But he wanted to rebel. And when he rebelled against God and wanted to be God, he was separated from God. And Satan, instead of calling out to God for mercy and grace, instead of doing that, he wanted to embrace evil. And unfortunately, that's what happens to so many of us is that God wants us to be His children, but instead we love the life of rebellion. We love running from God. When you read the book of Job and you read in 1 Chronicles, you'll hear those stories about how Lucifer became Satan. Unfortunately, there are a lot of people in this world who could be bright shining stars for God's glory. But they've chosen lives of selfishness. And Satan loves that. Satan absolutely loves that. I want you to know that Satan wants to take you down with him. That's his objective. He doesn't want to be in hell alone. He wants you to be there with him. You might have heard about the two boys that were walking home from Sunday school one day, and they were having this great conversation about the lesson they had heard, and they'd been studying about the temptation of Christ and who the devil was. And one little boy looked over at the other one and he said, Tell me, man, do you you know who the devil is? And the other boy looked at him and said, Oh, it's the same thing as Santa Claus. It's your daddy. (laughs) That's not quite true. Satan Satan is a real entity. Okay? Satan is real. And people who want to fool us, people who want to make us believe that there's no such thing as Satan, those people are being used by Satan. Satan does want to take you down. You know, if you've ever done any training uh, in life saving, That if someone is drowning, the thing you have to worry about is trying to save that person. Because when they're drowning, they're trying to pull you under with them so they can get on top of you. And that's a great illustration of how Satan is. He is drowning in hell. And he wants to pull you down with him. But God's beautiful plan is this, to come and to destroy Satan's plan. He's not going to let you go down if you don't want to go down. God is going to take care of you if you want Him to take care of you. God will bless you if you want Him to bless you. But He won't do that 
if you are holding on to the coattails of Satan? How can God bless you if you're holding on to Satan's coattails? In Enterprise, Alabama, when you go through that small area, there's a, a monument built there. Really an unusual looking monument. It's a monument built in the shape of a bull weevil. You think, well, what in the world are they thinking there? The bull weevil was actually a blessing for that area of Enterprise, Alabama because that whole community, that whole area was a farming area and at one time they invested all of their resources in growing cotton. And then one time there was this great plague by the bull weevil and it wiped out all the cotton crops. And so because every cotton crop was wiped out, the people of Enterprise Alabama began to diversify. They began to bring in new industry. And so today they celebrate the bull weevil because, in fact, let me read to you the inscription on that bull weevil. In profound appreciation of the bull weevil and of what it has done as the herald of prosperity. This monument is erected by the citizens of Enterprise, Coffee County, Alabama. They celebrate the bull weevil because it drew them closer to a better understanding of how to diversify and how to make money. They didn't invest in just one thing. Now that's a great illustration for us as Christians. You and I, although we realize that Satan is the enemy, recognizing that will draw us closer to God. When we recognize how destructive Satan is, it will draw us into God's presence. It helps us really to understand who the enemy is as we have conversations with our God. Jesus came to this place not just to defeat Satan's plans, but also to save us, to save all of humanity, but specifically to save your soul. Jesus came to save your soul. We have been born into this world of sin. We are sinners. We've got to admit that. We're broken people who need God. And if we don't admit that, then we are just fooling ourselves. Every person's a confirmed sinner. You're confirmed as a sinner. You might have heard about the church that was having a worship service on Halloween. And there was a man who was out in the community. He was headed to a party, walking to it, and he was dressed like the devil. And this terrible storm came up. And so he ran to the closest place he could go. He ran into the back door of the church, and everybody in the church saw him, and it scared them to death, and they all just left the place except for one little old lady sitting in the back. And she said, hey, don't bother me. I've been on your side all the time. Mm. Sort of scary, isn't it? Sort of scary, isn't it? When you think about the fact that God has come to free us. One of the songs that we sang a little bit earlier is a beautiful song that reminds us that we are no longer slaves. We don't have to be slaves to fear. We don't have to be slaves to sin. God says, I've got this. And I've got you. And I'm never, ever, ever going to let you go. I love you. But we have to come to that point of surrender. We have to come to that point when we say, Lord, take me as I am and make me what you want me to be. We are going to die. Woody Allen once said, I don't want to achieve immortality through my work. I want to achieve immortality through not dying. It ain't going to happen. We're all going to die. And the question is, where do you want to spend all of your eternity? I've been on this earth a little over 60 years now, and those have been the quickest 60 years I could have ever imagined. I remember my parents and I remember my grandparents talking about how fast time goes as you get older. It's so true. 
I mean, I see some of you nodding your heads. You know what I'm talking about. It goes by way too quick. We don't have much time left. So what are you going to do with the time you've got left? What are you going to do with the time that you've got left? God has come through Jesus Christ to wipe out Satan's plans of destruction for you. And God has come through Jesus Christ to save you. So today, I just want to ask you this. Are you willing to accept God's plan? Are you willing to submit yourself to His desire for your life? Are you willing to come before the throne of grace and ask Him to destroy the old and rebuild you brand new? This morning as we sing a hymn of invitation, my prayer is that you would surrender your life that you would allow God to come and do His greatest work in your life. I know His greatest work is still ahead, but we have to believe that. So this morning, let's all stand together as we sing a hymn of invitation and you respond as the Lord is leading you. Join us this evening, 5 o'clock, over at the Ruby Hunt YMCA. Uh, bring your bathing suits if you want to do that. Well, I know it'll be a great time of fellowship for us. There's plenty of room to safe distance if that's a concern for you. And, of course, we encourage you, if you want to bring uh, games for folks to play, do that too. But be sure to bring your own basket of food. The deacons will have some of that great ice cream ready for us, and we'll have a great time together. I love you. We're going to close in order of prayer. Charles, would you mind closing us, sir? Okay, you got that mask on. He says, I can't hear. Okay, then uh, how about you, B.A.? Would you mind? Thank you, sir. God, we thank you for the encouragement. God, we thank you for the hope that we have received this morning. God, as we go from this place, may we not be people of fear, but may God we be people of the light and we shine into the darkness. We thank you for your love for us. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen.